Hi, I'm Corey Butler. And I'm Sean Todd. And this is the Mind and Money Show, powered by Acevda Financial. On our show, we'll be going into a deep dive into the relationship we have with our minds, health, and our money. If you'd like to join us on our journey towards becoming better humans, stick around. We're back at it again. Well, Corey, it's going to be another great episode today. We've got a couple of really interesting guests today. I'm really looking forward to the introduction here. Very much, uh, which we will enlighten everybody about very shortly. As you know, on the Mind and Money show, we we kind of like to diversify and talk about an assortment of things. And Sean, you and I both kind of battle with climate change and some of the environmental challenges that are out there. And you know, we were kind of talking about some of the things that are in the media as of late. And what are your thoughts right now on that? Well, I just find it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I think it's one of those contentious topics that everyone seems to, to battle about. I mean, up until two days ago, I didn't even know we'd have snow this winter. I just read an interesting Globe and Mail article, and it was written by Eleanor Boyle. And she talks about how the environment is really our third world war. And it was, I just found that uh, a kind of a remarkable statement. Uh, because I think if we look back in history, we spent so much time and energy in the Second World War looking at maybe how we contained and, and ran ourselves. And now we're up against environment. And some people seem to push back against this. But I think it's important we start looking at you know, what is the solution to this. Well, you know, even if you boil it right down to when you get a present or you, you go out and you buy something from the store and the amount of plastic uh, that is you know, that it's encased in, you actually need special tools to open it up. And you have to start to wonder, you know, as we're out there buying the skill saw or the miter saw or all chainsaw, how many times am I going to actually use that tool or that yeah. toy? And it becomes, you know, that, uh, you know, how many things are sitting in your basement or your garage that you're really not you use using once. on a regular basis? hundred percent. We've become this disposable society. And I'm looking at even just the, the process of printers. So we have a home printer I use very rarely, but the, the best option for me sometimes is to buy another printer because of the cost associated. And it makes no sense whatsoever. I think there's smarter ways of doing this. Uh, but you're totally right. It's it's it is a it's a crazy world we have right now. And we all have those nightmares of our printers not working at home that we want to um, destroy, but we're not allowed to do that. Other things that we're looking at is you know as you know this is the mind and money show. A couple of things that we've talked about as of late is the coffee conspiracy, which is now probably evolved into. The subscription of online streaming. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. You know where where is your monthly cash flow going? Where is your wallet hemorrhaging because you've signed up for too many services? And I think that happens all the time. You start looking at some of the people we we know, and even myself, it's really easy to have a Netflix subscription. You have an Amazon subscription to Prime. Next thing you know, you have four or five monthly subscriptions. You're not even paying attention anymore, and it's just coming off and dripping off. And most people don't even realize what they are. So. Whether it's your, your business life, whether it's your personal life, I think it's important at the start of the year to kind of go back and say, hey, let's reset and start looking at some of these expenses. What can I contain? What can I take off? What am I not using? Because if you don't, it, it just starts to blow up. So wants versus needs, right? It's uh, You really have to pay attention to where that cash flow is going. And a lot of times, like you just mentioned, Sean, we, we really don't pay attention to it. You, you know, it, there was the coffee conspiracy written a few years back talking about how much a person would actually spend on coffee on a weekly basis. Yeah, it can kind of get out of hand, I'm sure. And people are spending a lot more than they even expect. I think that's true with most goals. If we don't actually keep focused on a goal, the next thing you know, you're just kind of rolling around and you don't even have a, you don't even have a direction anymore. So that's why I think the start of the year is so important and so key to say, what are my goals this year? What am I focusing on? Because if you, if you do that and you, and you create those goals yourself, you stay focused on them, you will obtain them. But if you don't, uh, it's surprising what happens in a year and what doesn't happen in a year. Well, we keep getting older and uh, we remember when our parents would tell us, you know, oh, you just wait, Sonny, you're, you're going to be 40 or 50 or 60 before you know it. You can't believe how fast the time goes by. Yeah. Well, it sucks. Yeah, for sure. And that's the same as uh, even using your investment accounts. So TFSA just went up $6,000 this year. Some people don't even use their TFSA or haven't used it properly yet. So I guess this is a great time to start saying, hey, I've got more room now. How do we allocate? 
because if you look at compound interest and how powerful it is to your retirement plan, it's a great time to start re, you know, looking at 2020 and saying, what can I do? Yes. And also as a reminder for the listeners, March 2nd is the RSP deadline this year. So if you're looking at that over the next little while, please don't hesitate to touch base with us if you're interested in furthering that conversation. 100%. All right, want to introduce the guest, Corey? Absolutely. Yeah. So the two gentlemen we have with us here today, we have Marillo Torres and Steve Cody. And for those that aren't familiar with those names, probably can't be from the Ottawa area, but these are two gentlemen from Ruckify. And our first guest started his first company in 1984 after dropping out of grade 10 in high school. A move not recommended for most people, but has certainly worked out well for him. He has been either a founder, CEO, or owner for all his roles in his working career. When he is not working, he is involved as a committee member or a chairman of, for three committees, including the committee member of Algonquin College, Entrepreneurship Advisory Committee, and he is one of the co-founders and CEO of both Ruckify and the Better Software Company. Welcome to the show, Steve Cody. Thank you very much. And also with us today is, what would actually be your, your title, Marillo? I, I don't want to screw this up because I know that it's been kind of, there's some banter yeah. around it. Yes. So... Thank you so much, you guys, to having us here. My name is Murillo Torres. I'm the growth manager with uh, Rockify. I work very close with the community. I'm the connector, so I need to bring the awareness. We are here trying to save the planet and engage homeowners like me, like you guys, to rent before you buy. So try and buy. And if you're going to use something for one day or two, why are you going to spend all this money? Especially for me, like a newcomer to Ottawa, I'm being in Canada only for five, almost six years now, and I have to start my life from scratch. I didn't have a lawnmower. I didn't have like a snowblower. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a house. I didn't have anything. So now thinking what Rockify is doing for people like me just arrive and they need some help just for the winter. That's my, my job. Make, the, make sure every single homeowner, at least in Ottawa, and now we're going United States and you're going global to show how important and environmental concern we need to be our future. It's fantastic. And, and my experience so far with Rockify has just been uh, overwhelming. You know, it's, it's just been a few weeks now, but first exposed to Rockify, it was our biggest client event of the year. It's 10 o'clock the night before my event, and we still had things we needed. And, and via what this was, we needed to have a light standard uh, for a photo shoot. And I reached out to Ruckify at 10 o'clock and was surprising enough that they connect, connected the dots. And we had, a, we had a great piece of equipment the next morning and the team supporting it was excellent. We came out to your facility. It was incredible to see the energy level of your team. It's, just, you. it's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So good on you both. But this is it's great how our, how our world's collided there a little bit. Yeah, it was pretty awesome for us to have the opportunity to get to sit in on your tiki time and yeah. see what you guys have going on on a weekly basis. And it's it's incredible what you guys have done with your environment. And, uh, you know, and we're going to get into it, but it's it's wonderful to see, you know, regardless of the challenges, it's wonderful to see the growth and the opportunity and the culture that you guys have created. It's fantastic. Steve, how does it feel like to look now, like obviously, you know, we're starting to talk a bit about your company and you being the one that had the you know a bit of an idea and a vision here and yep. and you start seeing this come together it how does that feel for you to see to see what you're hearing right now yeah i think it's it's a really good feeling so i mean it's i would say we're on track in terms of our vision for the company i think what we didn't realize early on was that we could become a global environmental disruptor we knew we could plant some trees and we could help the environment but we never really didn't sink in and it's really starting to sink in the more people we talk to uh we think we can be you know if not top three at least top 10 global disruptors sure. literally in terms of impact on the environment it's neat how it kind of falls into that place because when i first reached out to you that's not how i was thinking of Ruckify. yeah but then when i start to listen to some of the dialogue and see how how and why this will impact it that way yeah i realize yeah it's, it's going to be a changer well i mean over two million rvs in canada utilization on those rvs is like four percent you know, so if we can get people sharing them, that's a lot less tires and steering wheels and motors and everything else that people are going to have to buy because they're going to be able to share. 
So the impact is you're right down to a blender in your kitchen. If you're using it once or twice a year, maybe consider rectifying it because a lot of work goes into making that blender and disposing of that blender. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then and then you've been described most recently by the Ottawa Business Journal as a, a serial entrepreneur. So this is, which is, I, I think is a fantastic, <laughs> yeah. that's a fantastic title. I yeah. see, you should be proud of that. <laughs> but uh, what makes this company special? Because I know it sounds like you've had, you know, uh, several or, you know, I, I described up to 15 companies in the past. Yeah. So what makes this one really unique? It brings a lot of the different companies we've had over the years, and it kind of ties a lot together. Uh, we've built and sold six different rental companies. So obviously from a rental perspective, you know, we're, we're able to offer rentals. Uh, we're able to offer, now we're able with the uh, Ruckify stores, we can offer kind of the opportunity of somebody just out of their garage having their own little rental business or doing it out of their basement. Could be something they're passionate about. Could be, we have somebody who rents a bunch of sewing machines. They love sewing. So, you know, could be beehives. Uh, whatever you're interested in, now you can really kind of accelerate that Typically, you're not having to invest any money because you're going to use what you have or you're mm -hmm. going to use what your network has and you're going to make it available for rent. So it's kind of a 100% gross margin business. It's, so, so you know, to be able to offer that to others, I think, is very powerful. Uh, we've built a technology company in the past, so I think using that experience is helpful. And probably the most important, I think, is over time you realize how important people are. Uh, so it's the ability to be able to find great people, to be able to kind of let them loose and do amazing things. And I think that's kind of where we, we've been fortunate where we've done that so far with that's, Ruckify. That's incredible. And, and so who who would you give Tiki Time credit to? Who came up with that concept? Because that is, that's incredible. We yeah. should probably explain to the listeners what it even is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so Tiki Time, uh, basically four o'clock every Friday, what we do is... You know, everybody can grab a drink or, or whatever, um, but we stand around in a circle. Uh, I update the company in terms of anything that's happening. We're extremely transparent, uh, you know, right down to if you want to know how much money we have in the bank, I'll tell you how much money we have in the bank. So we're, because everybody in the company is an owner. So 10% of the company belongs to our team members. Um, and uh, so I'll stand, give an update, and then literally every single person so we're about 75 people now. It takes us about an hour and 10 minutes. Talks about how they're contributing to to our dream, to the success of, of Rockify. And I think that's, and we give out, there's four trophies, uh, four awards that are given out uh, for different uh, reasons. Uh, so it's just kind of a powerful way to end the week because I think, you know, more than talking about what you're doing, it's all the shout outs to your team members in terms of, you know, how they're contributing. And I think that's just, it's just super, it's very powerful. So you're and not, you're not, you're not just changing, you know, this business marketplace, you're changing how an employer treats their employees. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you know, I mean, for us, it's, it's literally, we're just a team, right? And we're all owners. And I think that makes a, a massive difference. So we're all going to share on the upside. Uh, we don't, we don't pay out commissions. We don't give bonuses, we're all just driving for one goal, and that's to be, you know, a globally dominant player in the sharing economy. Um, so, you know, yeah. That's one team, that's fantastic. one dream. Yeah, one team, that's one fantastic. dream. <laughs> so, so Mar Marillo, we kind of know the end story now. Like, obviously, this is great to sit around. We're going to do a podcast about this. Uh, you're, you're obviously happy with how this is turning out. But let's take us back four years ago. Four years ago, five years ago, it immigrated? Yeah. Yeah, five. so... Let's talk about the draw. What what made you want to leave and what was attractive about coming to Canada and some of the challenges you faced immigrating here? So first of all, for my family, Brazil is not a safe place to raise a family and the corruption and the politics, everything was too overwhelming for me and my wife to take care and how to educate our kids. Both of us, we had a chance to travel the roles. So I used to be a sales manager for IBM. And one day I came to Canada and I met with the Quebecois team and they opened their arms and really need someone like you with open mind, smiling, friendly, the connector. So it was a long process, it took me four years to get the permanent resident. And I was working for IBM and my dream was to work in uh, IBM when I moved to Canada. So, okay, it's going to be red carpet. They need IT guys. They need someone like me. And of course, the reality was not that. It was very hard for me, first of all, to learn a new language new culture. So I start to knock doors to ask for help. 
I strategically bought a house in Stittsville to be close to Canada because Canada is the Silicon Valley in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I had like my backyard, 500 IT companies. So I knock every single one looking for a job with a piece of paper, my resume. Okay, that's me, Murillo. And when I knock Steve Cody's door with the Better Software Company, he was growing the team. He was looking for software developers, C++, C++. Uh, graphic designers and said, Murillo, you're a great guy, but we don't need sales now. We are building the software. I said, okay, Steve, I, what are you looking for? How can I help you? So that was how we start to conversation. said, we are looking for investors. We're looking for all the software engineers, project managers. So I went back to the employment Ontario. They, what, the place was helping me to build my resume and help me to, to engage my life and start my life in, in, in the workforce in Canada. And I was giving back to Steve, okay, that's a very guy, good guy. I just met him. I had a coffee with this project manager. He's going to be the rock star. Please give a chance. I know his English is not very good, but if you just give a computer, he's going to prove his job. And we did this like more than 30 times. Like he hired a lot of people from my organization. It was a not-profit organization, help immigrants in Ottawa. So that's how I built my name, helping not only Steve, but another 150 companies hiring people because I was referring him, okay? I already met Chingling, I already met uh, Muhammad, I already met the Murillo. He's very good. Resume is not to reflect what you're looking for, but I, I know his personally, so I was putting my name on front of this candidate. So 40% of the interview was already done. So the hardest part for us newcomers or immigrants or anyone is looking for a job is to get that chance just to talk to the, the hire manager. So Steve gave, gave me that credibility. Jenna Suds opened her office. She used to run... Um, Cannot not be a. So I had the opportunity to talk with more than 15 uh, VP of HR, telling my story, how I'm going to prove who I am in a piece of paper. So give me a chance to be the ambassador for all these newcomers. So in 2017, I got an award, Welcome to Auto Award. So it was the my, uh, Minister of Immigration and Jim Watson, the mayor. And was I was not at home like for five years. I was knocking doors and asking for help. I need to save my life. I need to find something meaningful to go back home and pay my bills and do something. So in that opportunity, I had a chance to explain to my wife and my kids. I invite them to 150 people. The minister was there. The Jim Watson, the mayor of the city, and give me the award in front of everyone. And for the first time, I look in the eyes of my kids. Say, that's why I was not at home. So I was helping another 150 people to find jobs. And five years later, I was working for a big company, the biggest telecommunication company in, in Canada. It was my dream to have that position. I was a sales manager, make a lot of money, 25 employees. Nobody was looking at me like as an immigrant anymore because I was part of the top company in Canada. And Steve looked at me and said, that's not you. I was wearing like suit and tie. I was <laughs> leave the office. <laughs> <laughs> they had him caged up. I can't said, imagine. <laughs> what happened, Murillo? Said, what is that power like that of fire inside of you? Said, oh, but I think I achieved my goal. It's like to have that fancy job and a fancy job title. I'm I'm the biggest telecommunication company now. I but was not fulfilled inside. They don't care. Like we already spending millions and millions of dollars advertised. Murillo, you don't need like where you're from, like so when we had this meeting, at, uh, he invited me for the take time, and I fall in love. I said, okay, I need to work for you, this guy. So I was combining with community. I was engaged with all the community. I have a lot of good people to invite and to grow the company, so I knew it, who I want to bring to my team. I know what you need to be a hustler and make this a startup company. And I was missing that part to make a difference, not just be a part of the engine. I was working for that big company was just a piece of the, the engine. I, I need to deliver the numbers. I need to do my job, but it was not fulfill my needs. So I discussed with my wife. She got a job. Used to be only one income at home. So it was a big risk to leave this big company to work for a startup. So again, I helped another newcomer. It was my wife. She make her wish list. So now she has a good job. I don't have all the pressure on me. And now I was telling him driving today's, this is my plan E. A, Rockify need succeed. Was I'm putting my name, your name. We have 80, 80 families we need to make happen. I'm the the front one. I'm dealing with the client face to face. I'm knocking all those doors to promote Rockify, doing events. How I met Ben. How I met you guys. 
And that's what make my life fulfill. I don't care now about salary. I don't care about the benefits. I don't care about, because my, my life is not si- settled because now I'm working for a startup company, but you know, I feel like my space in the world, like Ottawa accept me, Rockify gave me the ownership. They give me everything initiative I want to do. He support me and he gave me the opportunity. Okay, if you think this is going to work, make happen. And, and now for me, it's, I don't say creating a monster, but I feel like so much power. What I do when I'm talking to people said, you're the owner, you created this company. He gave us 10%. So I can consider me an owner, but even if I don't have this 10%, I work every day if the company is mine. And I think like that's, Anyone is looking for a job or looking to move to Canada or looking for a change your life, just do your best every day and you're going to prove not just with numbers, but with attitude. When you talk, the same guys you met at Tick Time, it's, that's me. We don't need to pretend something. You just find your passion and you're going to do very well. If you're a very good cooker and if you want to work in a restaurant, start from the bottom and you're going to be a top chef in a few years, just work hard every day and you're going to step the ladder. So that's, Steve, give me this opportunity and I'm very pleased every day. I'm, I don't feel I'm working. I feel like I have like a very good opportunity in my hands to make happen and, and together we're going to make happen. Uh, your story, like the passion and the energy that comes out of Marillo is just fantastic. Like it uh, makes your heart warm inside. And I have to, you know, congratulate you on your, on all your success. So that's been fantastic. And now the, you had talked earlier about the organization that you volunteer some of your time to help out new immigrants to Ottawa. Um, did you want to talk about that a little bit? It sounds pretty interesting. I think a lot of people don't even realize that those things are even out there. And so I, I think it's, I think it's worthy of a couple of minutes to actually talk about that. I did a tech talk to talk about immigration. It's one big part of Canada. They are bring people to Canada, but integration is the key part. We need to feel integrated. We need few part of this. So first of all, of course, it's up to you to learn the language, go in the middle of the culture, like try to live as a Canadian, but we need to understand. So that organization called INTAC and have like seven more different uh, employment Ontarios to help immigrants to find a job in Ottawa. Any, not only immigrants, anyone's looking for a job, but it's, it's a very great area but I'm so glad. I think 75% of our team, they are, they're not from Canada. So for each Canadian here in Ottawa, we have four immigrants. So if the company don't we're understand. Better for it. We're better for it. Maybe better for it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely. So if you, if the HR don't know how to deal with the newcomers, if you don't know how to deal with like uh, different names, it's not just Peter, not just Jacks or Britney's, we have different names and that start like the, the beginning of the, the resume is your name. If you're already like Marillo, mm, <laughs> next, I need a Jack, I need a Peter. Right. So this happened all the time. 70% with the hirings, it start for the name. Really? So as soon as we start to remove the name from the top of the resume, you already have 70% more chance to get a job or at least an interview. And then they're going to check your education and they're going to check your Canadian experience. So all this... I don't say it took me five years to prove who I am to Steve, but I'm only here today because I have to pass through a lot. My first job was yes. landscaping here because I couldn't get like, and I was a sales manager in IBM and I moved to Canada with my wife and two kids. I have to start everything literally from scratch. So now I'm, what we have in our office is like, of not only Rockify, but I used to work for different companies and you see the inside the office, like the diversity but that start with the HR. So my job was to gain that confidence for the HR manager, the higher manager. Okay, I'm here today to introduce you to so-and-so. He's the chingling guy. He's very good. He just came from China, very good on computer. He's a rock star on C++. Just give a chance to him, like one, two, three months. Yeah. And few of these organizations helping with uh, fundings. So also better software and uh, Rockify use that to take the risk to hire someone you don't know. Nobody's refer you, but he needs a chance. So that's how I, I engage everyone to look after employers or employees or job seekers to look more careful like how we deal with 
those newcomers. It's a huge paradigm shift, right? And so, Steve, clearly, your, your ability to look past all that and, and, and capture great people is important. Uh, what qualities do you look for? What two or three qualities when you look at adding people to your team, yep. what resonates the most with you? Uh, well, number one, I never look at a resume. So it's really early days when we didn't have a lot of people. It was a lot of coffees at Starbucks. So yeah. just, you know, getting to know people. Uh, now, a little too busy, so it's people coming into the office, but it's always a conversation. Uh, looking for three qualities, really, in a person. So, you know, trying to get a sense, are you a good person? You know, do you help your community? Do you care about the community? How do you talk about your family? That, so you can kind of get a sense of the person. So we've got to make sure they're good people. Number two is, you know, are you relatively smart? Uh, which most people are, but that's something that's important. Uh, and the third thing is, are you curious? We're in the technology business, and if we don't hire curious people, we need everybody figuring things out. We need everybody looking for, you know, asking questions, looking for answers. Uh, so otherwise, you're kind of a passenger, and we can't afford passengers. So those are the three key qualities we look for. Um, and then if it's obviously, if it's a developer or something, uh, once they pass that, then, you know, we would go on to do some kind of test mm -hmm. or something, but you can train a lot of those things if you get the right person. Uh, and I think multicultural, we, we don't have, like, there's no plan in our office that X amount of people have to be men with like, I don't, I couldn't even tell you the numbers. We're just very accepting of anybody. We know we want to be a global company. And I think to be a glo global company, your company's got to, you know, the people in it have to be global, right? Sure. So I think what do, that, what do you see going, Steve? Like, a, obviously, you're going to go global. Yeah. So what's your vision there? Like, how do you see Recify expanding? Um, uh, where do you see this in five years? Uh, I mean, you know, I, we're going to go to, we're obviously in the U.S. So right now we're in uh, 24 U.S. cities. Uh, by next June, it'll be 44 U.S. cities. Uh, and we'll continue to grow that. Then we want to be heading over to Australia. We want to do UK and then take that and then just start penetrating Europe. Uh, so we do want to be a global player. That's kind of our ambition. And how do we get the average person to kind of just latch on to what Ruckify can bring them? So if I asked you right now, you know, could you explain to someone how they can make $200 next weekend by using Recify. Is that, is that something we could do? Because I think, yeah. I think someone. Yeah. My daughter does it all the time. They don't even understand it. I yeah. say, Hey, I, I spoke about it so many times in the last several weeks. Great concept. Most people don't realize that there's a peer to peer exchange here right in the city. And I yeah. think it's important. So how would you, if I said, go ahead, tell someone how they can make 200 bucks easy. I think maybe one of the best stories I can give you is somebody was at the Glebe garage sale and they bought a pair of crutches for a dollar. And uh, right away, they took a picture, put it put it on Ruck. So they posted it on Ruckify. They have their own Ruckify store. And he said, before he got home, he had a booking for $10. He had put them up for $10 for the day. <laughs> so kind of cool that you could buy crutches for a buck, buck, 10 extra money. You know, it's not a lot of money, but I think it's a symbol it of what can yeah. happen. My Corey's daughter, an investment guy, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> that's, that's a good return. I might, I might that's get a, that number. That's yeah. a great return. Seems like a big move. That <laughs> yeah. ROI is one. Yeah, it's yeah. a 10 bagger. <laughs> yep. You know, I mean, if we look at our office, there's a lot of people now that are kind of starting to count on that income. Maybe they've got a camera sitting at home. Uh, they've rented it out a dozen times, you know, but that camera's just sitting there doing nothing. My daughter's got this projector. kind of fancy, yeah, she's got a little projector. She rents it like almost every week. Every I didn't, week. Like, I didn't even know. Anyways, people rent it. They love it. The feedback's great. She's got a bike. Uh, we have Keith. He had paddle one. Boards. He he had the paddle, the stand-up board. What do you call those things? Paddleboard. Uh, SUPs. Or yeah, the yeah. SUPs. Yeah. He had one in the summer. Uh, was really busy. It was actually his girlfriend's. Then he bought a second. And he put up his air conditioner, put up some fishing rods. Anyways, he made 2400 bucks wow. in two months. So wow. for somebody on a fixed income, you know, I don't know if you're reporting this 2400 bucks, but anyways, whatever, like it's 2400 bucks. Sure. Like that's, you know, that's a lot of nice dinners or something, right? Yeah. And there's, so, some, and there's yeah. some neat things being rented. I just saw oh, yeah. the post on Twitter, I think it was yesterday, and you guys are posting, uh, that was the virtual headset, and yeah. I forgot what They're it's popular. called. We had two oh, orders yeah. yesterday for virtual headsets. Well, I saw the post, yeah. and it yeah. said, hey, you want to get your team together, have a fun day, yeah. rent this. And I'm like, this looks fantastic. I need to find a reason to do this. Zamboni, you know, if you want to be Is like that cool right? in the neighborhood. Well, that would be fun. <laughs> I can't believe the inventory of items that are available to rent now. There's stuff that you just don't even think about. You brought up a camera. 
I don't know how many people would even consider that. And it's like, what a phenomenal idea. And it's even the lenses more than the cameras. Like these lenses are 3000 bucks. Right. Right. And so the photographers, we've got a whole network of them in Ottawa. They love it. So it's a great place. I'm I'm a big Simon Sinek guy. So I, I love his kind of mentality. Uh, and he always talks about the why. Yeah. So he says, Hey, you got to know the why. Yeah. So tell us a little bit of why this started. Like, I'd love to know the story a bit. You know, how did you, what brought this t- together? Uh, I mean, probably about four and a half years ago, we had a storm come through the neighborhood and a bunch of trees had fallen down, big one out front of my house and heard the chainsaw going right after the storm had passed, went out and my neighbor, Bruce, he loves a chainsaw. Uh, so he was out there cutting up the tree. He said, Steve, I can... I can get everything, but I can't get the stump because the blade's not big enough. Uh, and we kind of thought, oh, you know, like a neighbor's got to have a bigger chainsaw. And, uh, but we had no way of knowing that. And we kind of thought, man, we should create an app for that, you know, but he was built, he was busy building a company called Canopy Growth at the time. Yeah. Just a w- little bit busy. Little bit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit busy. <laughs> kind of turn, kind of turned into a $20 billion company. Uh, anyways, uh, so uh, he, that worked out well for him and, uh, I was building better software and, uh, ended up, uh, uh, leaving better software June, 2017 and, uh, started Ruckify that night. Just thought, okay, let's do it. Called up Bruce. Said, you want to do it? And, uh, we kind of planned out the vision. We knew right off the bat that, you know, we thought this could be global. Uh, nobody had really figured this out yet. And, uh, we had a bit of knowledge in terms of how rentals work, understood a little bit about technology. So we said, we took two years. We said, we're going to take two years. We're going to build out some great technology. We had 12 go-to-market tests that we wanted to do. How do you build supply? How do you build demand? And all the things in between. Uh, I had to find a good CTO, somebody to build the technology. So we found a guy named Graham Brown. He built Corel, which is a local company. He built that software, WordPerfect, when they acquired him. So yes. uh, just a great human being. So he came on and... Uh, you know, so yeah, so that's kind of how we, we've built it up so far. That's fantastic. And I believe your daughter had something to do with the name, correct? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was going to, I had a really good idea of calling it uh, Rent It, and I had a logo done. I got to take a lot of time on this. <laughs> had the name registered, and my Katrina was 14 at the time, and I showed her, and I, you know, you think, oh. But anyway, she says, that's really stupid, Dad. And uh, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, and why is that stupid? And she's like... She said, well, first of all, you can't use the word rent because you're doing something completely different. You're actually getting people to share. And uh, so she said, if you use word rent, then, you know, that that's already in people's brains. So they're wow. compared to like, you know, Hertz or other rental companies. And she said, it has to be a verb because this is going to be global. This is going to be wow. big. People have to refer to it. So I'm like, okay. And uh, like, we're an entrepreneurial family. So this is like, you know, it's yes. just is the way it is. And uh, so I said, you figure something out. So she went to the basement and uh, came up half an hour later and had the word ruck. And it had the two dots over the U. And I like, I thought, well, that looks, looks kind of cool. And I'm like, well, what does it mean? And she says, well, it means to exchange in German. I said, well, that's okay. Perfect. So kind of, at least it makes sense. Uh, but then I started thinking, well, if somebody gets mad at us and they change the R to an F, right, that could be bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that we all know Shopify. So we said, let's add the FI in. Anyways, yes. there you go. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, that's how it all came yeah. I hadn't thought of that before, but so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, I think for a lot of people, you know, they get stuck in their job and they're making X amount of money and they – People just don't really understand how one would make the leap to, to say, I'm going to, you know, be the captain of my own ship. And uh, where do I even start? What do I do? And, you know, we're lucky to have you here with us today. And you've done this more than once or twice. And so my question is, like, what would you say to people about, like, you know, if you wanted to become an, an entrepreneur, like, what would you do? Where would you start? How would you? Yeah. Probably the most important thing is you have to think about what do you want the outcome to be? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Do you want freedom? Do you want to create a good lifestyle? Or do you want to create another Facebook or another Rockify? So I think once you know what you want the outcome to be, that'll determine kind of what your actions want to be. So if you want to build another Rockify, you got to sell your soul. And that's not a job. That's, that's all consuming. It's a lifestyle. Uh, so there are no holidays, you know, there are no evenings, whatever, like it, you're all in. Uh, but if you want to, you know, if you want freedom, you want a life, you might want to look at franchising. So, you know, and you have to kind of look at it that way. Um, you know, you talk about kind of being the captain of your own ship. I think 
the bigger you want it to be, the more you need to burn that ship because mm-hmm. the more you need to commit. So you can't, you can't have one foot in and one foot out. Right. Uh, you might be able to transition if you wanted to start a little Ruckify business, for example, that's all about freedom and that's all about a little income. It's still owning a business and some people want it for prestige or, you know, just to say they have this little business. Mm-hmm. So you can put up your own logo on your Ruckify store. You can send people there. It's just like having your own business Co- cost you nothing. That's a way of owning your own business, right? So it, it all depends. What, what do you want the outcome to be? I think that's what you need to answer first. And yeah. how accepting does an entrepreneur have to be of failure? Because I, I often sit there and think of people who look out and say, oh, I wouldn't mind being a business owner. I wouldn't mind being an entrepreneur. I don't think they're ready or don't understand the challenges that a business owner has. And that when you have your first hurdle, you know, your first business idea doesn't work out the way you wanted. How comfortable do you have to be to change? Because when I listened to Bruce Linton, he seemed to be very comfortable with that idea. You know, with failure as an entrepreneur, I I mean, that's part of your fear. I think it's it's part of what motivates you. You don't want to fail. Um, I think a lot of people kind of talk about failure like as a badge. I personally don't see it as a badge. I think you, you, you know, it's almost like selling. Uh, if you try to sell to somebody and they say no, does that mean you never go back to them again? Maybe you just didn't sell to them properly or they didn't understand. So you call them up two or three times and you just go at it differently. So when you're building a business, you don't stop just because it's not working. Uh, you figure out a different way to do it because it's going to, you're going to find a way it's going to work. Right? right. So, you just have to be persistent. So I don't think it doesn't have to be failures. What just, are the ingredients? It's got to change yeah, the ingredients. Yeah, it's got it. It's never what you think it's going to be. Like, sure. it's just not. And just be okay with that. I was, we had a business once and one of, one of my partners was an accountant. And, you know, he didn't like change. And I realized then that that's probably not, like, he would be great to run a business, but not great to build a business. Right. Right. Because there is just, you have to pivot, you have to change. And that's just part of what you need to do. Daily. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure when you, and, you and Bruce <laughs> were speaking about Ruckify at the early stages, you probably weren't even seeing the RV edition at that point in time. Uh, that we knew. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'd say probably out of any business I've done, but the, the I mean, the story's not written yet. Uh, this one's kind of followed pretty much the narrative we expected. So okay. we knew... You know, we, we're going to buy a car rental marketplace. We're going to buy a boat rental marketplace, a camera rental mar- So we know the ones we're going to buy because sure. they're verticals that already have market acceptance and penetration in. Nobody nobody really has the lock on renting a, a, a blender. You know what I mean? So we're going to, that's for us to create and for us to own or pressure wash it, right? So in a marketplace setting. So, right. Excellent. Yeah. I often say with people with, you know, that, that see entrepreneurs, business minded people, that it's very much that iceberg type analogy, right? You're only seeing the, the, the top 10% and the, the, the other 90 is, you know, all the insanity and the sleepless <laughs> nights and they trying to make ends meet and all those things and, and keeping done. life in check on a day to day basis. It's a, it's an ongoing challenge for sure. So. Yeah. I really like that Bruce Linton quote from the CBC article. It's either a rocket ship to the moon or fireworks that explode. Yeah. I think that kind of fits in perfectly with what you were just talking about, the failure, then the iceberg thing, because you're putting all this effort into it, but you're not sure where it's going to go at the very end, right? Yeah. You're, yeah. I mean, you're never you're never sure. Uh, this one's a little different because nobody's done it before, right? Like, so that, that kind of makes it a little more exciting. Um, and it, it, so many things are about timing. And, you know, are, is the world ready for this? Uh, we think so. We don't think they're ready necessarily. It's not like you don't sit at home and think, oh, I think I want to rent a blender. Uh, but if you start thinking about the impact that blender has on the environment, you might say, oh, maybe I'll rent a blender. You know, you know. so that's kind of how we start changing. Of course. Th- that's, that's our why, really, is the environment. Well, and- listening to you guys, you know, when we got to participate in your Tiki time and talking about the environmental impact – that was something that was so far removed from yeah. my brain walking in there. And then to hear you guys talk about it, it makes so much sense. And to think that you're going to become, you are becoming this environmental disruptor. It's phenomenal story. Well, we have, I mean, it's, and the younger you are, the more, you know, we have kiosks right now in the plate against sports. So you could go in there and you can rent skates in a plate against sports. And uh, we have people that we just kind of go in and do secret shopping and listen and just so we can make things better. And what's really cool is all their associates are young people. 
And when they're talking about Ruckify, they're not talking about renting. They're saying, if you rent, they plant a tree on your behalf. You know what I mean? So it's all, it right. just goes right to the environment. Like they're not thinking about the rental. They're just, they're thinking about the benefit to the environment. I don't yeah. blame them because they got a lot to worry no, about. That's a huge story. That's yeah. a huge story for How sure. many trees have you guys planted now? This has been an ongoing theme that I've been hearing about for a little while. So well, it's- our goal is, is to plant a billion. So that's the impact we want to have. But, you know, in saying that, the trees are really a symbol mm-hmm. Of the impact. Uh, the impact is much greater than planting a billion trees. Right. It's all about, you know, the container ships that come across the ocean that need to carry that pressure washer that you're only going to use once a year. You know what I mean? That's kind of the real thing. Uh, all trees are plant. We don't plant the trees. We use a third party partner, which is called Eden. They've done, I think, half a billion trees already. Wow. Uh we get like, it's a double bonus because not only are they planting trees around the world, but they're employing farmers that need to make money. And a lot of these trees are just used to support the soil so that for agriculture. Right. So it's all these benefits. It's not just a tree, but it's, you're empowering people. So the power is, it's, it's, it feels really good. It's fantastic. It's incredible. Uh, Marillo, most influential person in your life? My life? Yeah. You can't I'm say already Steve. being married now for <laughs> 20 years. So I, yeah. I can say I was 18 years old when I met my wife and she's a German personality, German woman, like very strong. And she, she's the one I was telling exactly the same thing to Steve driving here. If it was not because of her, like I couldn't do what I do. So I couldn't help 150 families if she was not there helping my family, my kids to grow. And now they can imagine like a two little kids from Brazil had to learn English, French. And now we just had like a interview with the teachers because now they're going to Brazil, going to miss like four weeks of school and said, all grade A's. You don't need to wow. worry about the kids. Just let them go. They're going to learn so much more going back to their own country. So she is the strong person beside me. I don't have anyone. I don't have family. I don't have friends. I don't have anyone here in Canada. So, and we are together right, for 20 years. If I did everything wrong in my life, I could say I did, but the only thing I did right was to be with that girl when I was 18. I'm 42. And I can see Steve with his wife is the same. Our partner is the same. We had an investor owns a winery company. She is the same. When you talk Shad and Cherie from uh, Real Estate, yeah. very, I went for lunch with them and family. So we have big names outside. Books I read, I read where I know, but when you go back home and you feel like you're safe, that's priceless. Like that give me more power to wake up the next morning to do everything again and again and again. And so she is, I think, I don't know if you share this with me, but if you have someone like Natalie or Carla with us in that crazy journey, help us a lot. Incredible. What do you, Steve? What's uh uh, it's going to sound like an odd answer, but I'm going to go with the same as Murillo. So my wife, we met uh, in high school. She was in grade nine. I was in grade 10. We've had five kids, uh, many different businesses. She's been my partner in every single one, probably the smartest person I know. So, yeah. And I, I don't, I mean, we were in the franchising business and I saw people trying to get into business without the support of their partner. I think it's, I'd almost say it's impossible. Losing proposition. Yeah. It's like literally impossible. Like if there's anything, like forget about money, forget about good idea, bad idea. Like if you're not going to be supported, um, if you can't go home and have somebody to kind of talk to about it and just, you know, somebody that's fully invested with you, they don't need to be your partner, but they need to support you 1000%. Yes. Uh, I think that's kind of your biggest indicator of failures if you don't have the support of your partner. Wow, this is so powerful. I can, yeah. Well, there's a stability that we, you know, we all kind of long for it on a day-to-day basis. And having that, you know, if it's your spouse that you turn to for that, it's a very powerful thing. So it's fantastic. I just want to rewind for two seconds. Merlo, you say you have no friends. What about, what about me? <laughs> well, well, you have have right. comes out. Yeah. 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 That's right. You know, That's right. It's over. Um, but I just got to tell one story. Like two years ago. I broke. I didn't have money to buy a turkey for Christmas. And I, when you have money, when you're in the top, everybody's close to you. But when you really need friends, you cannot count in one hand. So now I know who's my real friends. If I need someone to ask for help, it, I know they're going to be there. So 
friends. I'd buy you a turkey thing. any day, buddy. I know. <laughs> yeah. Now we will. Yeah. Steve, I do have a question for you just before Sean jumps in. So you met Murillo five years ago. He's door knocking, going hustling hard. What was your first impressions of Murillo when he came through? Well, I told them, I said, like, you got you to gotta find a way to work for us someday. I mean, that was, I think, pretty much maybe the first sentence or second sentence. Because look, look at the sparkle in his eyes. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. just, you see the enthusiasm, you see he's a good, like he's a good person. Like I talked about, I talked about curiosity. I talked about smart and I talked about being a good person. Yeah. Like he checks off all those boxes. It's amazing. Spades, it's right? amazing listening yeah. to you because it almost sounds like, I don't know if you're a football fan, but Bill Belichick took on Julian Edelman when he didn't, Julian Edelman used to be a star quarterback and was too small. So mm-hmm. Bill Belichick took him on and said, I don't know what we're going to do with you, yeah. but you can come on my team. <laughs> ends, up, ends up being the, one of the best receivers of all time, right? Awesome. So he turns into this. So it kind of reminds me of this. It's like, you know, hey, I don't know what we're going to do with you yet, but you're going to be a great addition to our team. What a great story. Yeah. I know. I, first handily, I experienced it with Merlo when I went to you guys' open house. We text talked for about two weeks straight and just about, about Rockify and about life and stuff like that. So when you met him, the same experience wow. I had with Merlo and just from meeting him at an open house, just talking to somebody. Yeah. It was crazy. Like, it's an impact that's going to be on Good my Good person, life. right? And you can feel it. Oh, so, right. genuine like, as hell. You can do like, anything with that. And to work every day, like, my goal is to bring good people. I post how happy I am in my job. It's crazy work, of course, but we need to bring good people to us. So every tick time, I invite a guest, like I invite you, invite because they need to feel the room. They need to feel that energy. If they don't fit in, it's that's already a big red flag. Okay, is not the right person because right. we need to build something very big and we need to motivate people to bring that to the next country or next city or next challenge or next industry. Mm-hmm. So what Steve is building and give us the opportunity is very, even if he don't have a room, like it's not open door boss, it's even don't have a room. So he always around talking, very friendly. And every single one's in that room, in that office is a go-getter and need to make happen. So if not, they feel like I'm not contributing enough or they're going to quit or going to get fired. Like it's a very fast paced growth company and you need to be the next Shopify, the next Amazon. We cannot miss one second. Well, I, I can feel it. I mean, we're not part of your team, but it's just, it's quite clear. It's, it's awesome. powerful. Merlo, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time today to come. I know it's, it's nice to get a chance to speak to you both. Talk a little bit about your past, some of the challenges uh, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate yeah, the time here. Thank yes, you very thanks much. guys for coming. It's been a wonderful uh, 60 minutes with you and uh, the stories that you're able to provide our listeners with. We appreciate. And again, congratulations on all the success and the future success ahead of you. Thank you very much. And thanks. A terrific job. And uh, sure. And thanks. if someone wants to find you, let's, let's just uh, give a shout out here. How would the best find Ruckify and connect? Uh, Ruckify.com. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Steve Cody on LinkedIn. Okay. It's it's Instagram easiest. site, Twitter site. No, I just, I'm not really a tech person. But so Rockify LinkedIn. itself, I think. Well, is, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Okay. It might be in a few of those social yeah, media yeah. places, of course. Of course. Yeah. And I'll, uh, My uh, abilities yeah. are limited. Yeah. 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 It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. And then for us, I just want to say uh, uh, I'm Sean Todd and we're with uh, Quay Butler and obviously being brought to you by Steve Financial. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, please connect with us on our explainthis.ca where we'll have more information about today's podcast, uh, some information about your financial planning and investment needs going forward this year. And Corey, anything else to say? Yeah, again, just thank you for everybody coming with us today and coming on this journey and signing off and look forward to our next encounter. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. To learn more about the topics we've spoken about, check out our blog page at explainthis.ca. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us in your favorite podcast app. This is Sean Todd. And Corey Butler. Until next time.